If you've never been in Chicago for New Year's Eve, don't go. <laughs> Just don't. It was New Year's Eve, we were visiting Brooke's brother, and her parents had got us a suite in a hotel with more than, it had more than one room, and, and so they were going to sleep in part of it, and we and the boys were going to sleep in the other part of it, and it was a great gesture, and it was nice, and we were going to have some family time and celebrate the ringing in of 2019 in the Windy City. Sounds wonderful. Except when the hotel overbooks itself. And if you've ever tried to get a hotel room in downtown Chicago where you've already parked your car blocks away so you don't have access to your car to drive to a new hotel, you will soon discover that there's not a hotel room to be, ha to be had in that entire city. And so the suite that we were supposed to have with the two rooms turned into one room for six people. Two queen beds. If you've ever tried to sleep with your wife and two children in a queen bed, you know the statement, try to sleep, is accurate. Because apparently my son decided to start practicing kickball with my kidneys as the ball as soon as I laid into bed. Now, it may have been possible if we all laid on our sides and laid long ways. And the only way I made it through geometry in high school was to cheat. But you don't have to be a mathematician to understand that when your child decides to lay horizontally instead of vertically when you're attempting to have four people in a queen bed, it's not going to be a good night's sleep. By God's providence and a sheer miracle, occasionally my eyes would be so heavy that they would close in sweet, sweet slumber, only to be awakened by either the kick in the kidneys or the elbow to the forehead, as my children were somehow able to sleep very soundly. Now, my wife looked at me and said, I'm not doing this any longer. And I'm like, exactly, we should have gone home. She's like, that's not what I mean. <laughs> like, yeah, that would make too much sense, wouldn't it? And so she went, and she laid herself on the ledge by the window, and for those of you who are saying, what kind of husband allows his wife to go lay herself in the ledge of the window? First, I want to remind you that she chose to do this. <laughs> and second of all, someone had to stay with the children. Far be it for me to put my wife's kidneys in danger. I had to have that cross to bear. I got maybe 17 minutes of sleep that night. Ringing in, good old 2019 was not on the highlight list. And never again will I rely on somebody else to make reservations for me when I go somewhere. But the kids, they wanted to be close. And they were. We've never been closer. And quite frankly, I hope to never be that close again. This morning we're continuing our series in life. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for being here. My name is Brian. I'm part of the team here at Lakeside, and we are glad that you're here. If you're just joining us, we're just going to catch you up on where we've been first. We saw that if we follow Jesus in this life, there is nothing to fear. We can walk through life without fear, and we can face death without fear if we are followers of Jesus. Then we saw that all life is designed by God, and so all life has intrinsic value in all life matters. Then we saw that in life, each of us are going to have pursuits, and we need to be careful what we pursue. We need to be careful what we aim for. Then we saw that sometimes we're going to, we're going to experience struggles, and so how to walk through struggles. And we saw as well that sometimes we're going to experience success, and so we looked at how to handle success, and today we're going to talk about aging. Today we're going to talk about the process of growing older. And we're going to be looking at a psalm. If you have your phones or your tablets, pull them out and you can follow along in the Bible app, which is a free download in the app store. 
um, or, or the Google Play Store. If you're on an Amazon Fire tablet, good luck, but you can find it there too. Just type in Bible, you'll, you'll find it there. You can follow along in the Bible app event section. If you don't have that on your phone or your tablets, we'd really encourage you to get it. But otherwise, you can follow along on the screens as we look at a psalm written by King David, the guy they have the statue of over in Europe. And we're going to be looking at Psalm 71 written as he got older in his life and he had more perspective. We're going to jump into this song. That's what the psalms are. They're songs. And so we're going to jump into this song in, in verse 12 where we read these words, O oh God, be not far from me. O oh my God, make haste to help me. There are times that people want God really, really close. There are times that people want God to feel like you felt, like you've, you've ever crammed into a queen-size bed with three other people. You just want God really near. And oftentimes what we find is for a lot of people, this happens very early in their life and oftentimes in the latter stages of their life. There, there's something about us, for most, for most of us, that we, when we feel less vulnerable, we don't, we don't equate our need for God the same. Whether it's because we're talented people or we have skills and, and gifts and abilities, whether, whether we're convinced that we can do it on our own, whatever the case may be, for a lot of us, r r really early on in our lives, there is an intense hunger and an intense desire for God. But as we grow older, that fades quite a bit. And we feel like, we can do this. And then for some, it's a medical diagnosis. For some, it's a failure. For some, it's just the world that we desperately want and comes crumbling down all around us. And the need for God is once again awakened. But, but for many of us, there, there, can be this, there can be this lull where we don't feel that we need God. And it really takes something catastrophic for us to desire to be close to God. Once again. But David's there as he gets older in his life. And don't get me wrong, he made plenty of mistakes along the way. And so maybe you're there right now in the midst of a mistake. Maybe there's some regrets. Maybe there are some things in your life right now that, quite frankly, you know aren't going according to plan. Or, or you're conducting yourself in a way you know you shouldn't be conducting yourself. And God feels really distant. God feels really far. I just want to encourage you. You don't have to throw in the towel. You don't have to quit. You don't have to say to yourself, well, I made some mistakes, so I'm done. It isn't going to work for me. God still desperately wants to be involved, and he wants his story to intersect with your life story, even in the midst of mistake, even in the midst of heartache, even in the midst of regret that you are currently building for yourself. God desperately wants to intervene in your life. So you are never too far gone for God to want something to do with you. Never forget that. You're never too far gone for God to want something to do with you. And here's David, and he's made those mistakes, and he's learned some hard lessons, and his family, in many respects, ended up as a wreck as, as a result of the choices that he made, and it, it just, it got ugly, and it got nasty at times, but when you look at what Scripture tells us about him in the midst of his failings and in the midst of his faults, he was a man after God's own heart, and we continue this song when he says, may my accusers be put to shame and consumed with scorn and disgrace, may they be covered who seek my hurt. But I will hope continually and will praise you yet more and more. Let me read this again. May my accusers be put to shame and consumed with scorn and disgrace. May they be covered who seek my hurt. Apparently, apparently David's mother never told him, if you don't have anything nice to say about somebody, don't say anything at all. And for those of you who are listening right now, this is in the Bible, all right? This is in the Bible. So I'm not saying clap back at your mom, but I'm just saying you file that one away, all right? Because apparently what he's saying about his accusers isn't nice at all. God wreck their lives, ruin their lives. Let them be put to shame. Let me watch. Let it be fun. I'm just going to tell you, the Bible tells us to pray for our enemies. If this is what it means, I can do that, right? <laughs> like, I got you. I got you. I'll pray for my enemies. Yeah, let them be ruined, God. Amen. All right? So I'm just saying, it's right there. As you get older, as you get older, you're going to realize that you're going to have accusers. You're going to have critics. You're going to have people that don't like you. Never forget a college professor of mine. He said this, and it always stuck with me. He said, in my 20s, I cared desperately what everyone thought of me. And that's true for most of us. 
In our 20s, we're constantly concerned about what, what everybody else is thinking about us. And they said this. Once I, once I got in my 30s, I realized I don't care what anybody thinks about me. And so there's that freedom when you let go of that bondage of worrying constantly what everybody thinks about you and what everybody's going to say about you and how everybody's going to feel about you. And when you're just like, forget it. I'm just going to do my own thing. I'm not going to worry what everybody else thinks about me. And then he said this. Once I hit my 40s, I realized nobody's thinking about me. (laughs) That's incredible perspective. Incredible. You realize as you get older that there are going to be people who criticize you. It doesn't matter what you do. There are just going to be some people who don't like you. And if you constantly try to appease everybody and if you constantly try to earn everyone's favor, you will be miserable. I'm not saying go out of your way just to make people hate you. I need to throw that disclaimer in. I know. But what I am saying is let yourself go from this idea that everyone has to love you. Because it isn't going to happen. And the longer you chase that desire for everyone to love you and everybody to to just agree with every choice that you make, the more unfulfilled you will be. You are going to have critics. You are going to have people who do not like you. And that's okay. A wise person once said, haters going to hate. All right? Haters going to hate. Let them. Don't allow them, don't allow them to dictate the course of your life. Don't alter your course trying to appease everybody. It's never possible. It's never going to work. You do you. You do you. You make the right decisions. You make the right choices. And forget the haters. Just keep going. My mouth will tell of your righteous acts. Of your deeds of salvation all the day. For their number is past my knowledge. With the mighty deeds of the Lord God, I will come. I will remind them of your righteousness. Yours alone. David just says this. He says, my purpose is going to be to proclaim the message of God. My purpose is going to be to proclaim the message of God. And he steps back and he says, this is the greatness of God. This is how great God is. If we were to count the, if we were to count the works of God, it is impossible. When we all step back and we really reflect on how great God is and all that God is doing, it is impossible for any of us to really factor in just how many times God is at work, just how great God is when he shows up and when God moves. It will blow our minds, and it's literally impossible for us to fathom and for us to factor in when we look and when we really process what God is up to and what God is doing. And so he just says, my purpose, my purpose is going to be to proclaim that greatness. I am going to reflect on the greatness of God, and my purpose is going to be to proclaim that message. That God is great. And God wants to do great things. And God is doing great things. And we have a choice to make. And this is what's so incredible. That God doesn't need any of us. He doesn't. That's not to discourage you. It's not to be like, oh, well, thanks for that uplifting message. The reality is God doesn't need any of us. The, The just incredible thing is God chooses to utilize us. That God would choose us to partner with him in the work that he is doing. Not that he needs us. And then he says this, O God from my youth, you have taught me and I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. You have taught me. You have taught me. Learning lessons is part of life. Learning lessons is part of life. So with that said, I just want to encourage you. Be gracious to younger people. Be gracious to younger people. Learning is part of life. Kids and and teenagers and young adults and adults and senior citizens, we're all going to make mistakes, every single one of us. That is part of life. 
And learning is part of that process. And so we need to make sure, especially to younger people, that we're gracious with them. We shouldn't expect them to get it right the first time. We just have to understand that that learning lessons is part of life. Be gracious to younger people. And for those of you who've gone before, be a resource to younger people. Be gracious to them and and just understand, all right, they're going to make some mistakes, but be a resource to them as well. Be willing to come alongside them. Now, choose your spots. Choose your spots. And nobody wants somebody to come in and tell them exactly how they should do everything that they're doing and how everything that they're doing is wrong. Nobody wants that. But choose your spots. Come alongside. And for those of you who've been there before, be a resource to those who are coming up. Share with them what you've learned. On the flip side, for those of you who are younger, be gracious to older people. Be gracious to older people. Be willing to approach those who've gone before you. We need each other. We need each other. My parents and grandparents were up visiting this weekend, and my son yesterday got a new video game that he was really excited to get, and I wouldn't get it for him. So, of course, when the grandparents come, he's all over that. And they're like, well, of course, you're the grandkid, right? Like, we'd have never done this for you when when you were our kid, but since it's a grandkid, absolutely. And so, last night, my, my son wanted to play his, his grandpa, my dad, in, in the game of FIFA, which is the video game that he got. And, and so he's up there, and, and I come upstairs just a little bit later, and he's, he's just got a big old smile on his face. I'm like, dude, what, what's up? He's like, I'm beating, I'm beating Baba, which is what he calls my dad, even though that means grandma in Romanian, but we'll let that slide. Uh, I didn't pick it. I would have. That would have been amazing, but I didn't. <laughs> It's just like God smiled upon me, and I'm like, that's awesome. And so I come in the room, and my dad's sitting there hitting all the buttons, and, and he's just got a big old smile. I was like, I'm beating Baba four to nothing. And I look at the screen, and if you've ever played FIFA 20, there's a little arrow over the guy that you're controlling, and my dad's hitting all the, all the buttons, and I'm like, where's your player? He's like, I don't know. I'm like, so I, I pause the game. Now, these weren't real-time minutes, okay? They were playing an accelerated clock because my dad didn't want to have an actual 90-minute soccer match. But they were a good 12 minutes into the game at this point when I realized that my dad's controller wasn't even turned on. The man's hands were sweaty from all the buttons he was hitting. And his controller wasn't even turned on. To play the game. If you're younger, be gracious with older people. (laughs) They need help too. Now it looks different. They have more wisdom in a lot of regards than you have. You have more wisdom technologically than they'll ever have. My sons know how to do more things on my tablets than I do. And it's really sad for me. It's really sad because I used to love to make fun of old people who didn't know how to use their phone. And what I'm realizing is I've become the old person who doesn't really know how to use all the things on my tablet. It's really frightening. It happens so quick. It happens so quick. But if you're, if you're younger, be gracious to older people. Approach those who've gone before you. Let's just collectively say, and we've talked about this before at Lakeside, and it's one of the things that we've just said, this is us and this is what we're going to do. But this is going to be a place where we just stop the generational wars, all right? I know some of you might think millennials are the worst generation ever, and some of you are like, thanks baby boomers for all the debt and you're going to die and leave us with appreciate. We're just going to stop that, all right? We're not, we're not going to engage in it. Here's the deal. Millennials are messed up. Baby boomers are messed up. Every generation's messed up. But collectively, we're people who want to follow Jesus and love each other. So we're just saying at Lakeside, we're done, all right? We're not going to make fun of... We're done. We're done. This is a place for people who are young. This is a place for people who are old. This is a place for people who love Jesus. This is a place for people who are searching for Jesus. This is a place that every single person who walks in those doors has the right and expectation to be loved when they walk in. And that is what we will be here at Lakeside. 
So even to old age, David continues in verse 18, and gray hairs, O God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to another generation, your power to all those to come. Here's what he says. Even as I'm old, even with the old age and the gray hairs, I'm not done. If you're not dead, you're not done. If you're not dead, you're not done. And notice what he says his desire is to do. That his desire is to proclaim God's greatness to the next generation. That his desire is to proclaim God's greatness to the next generation. This is why, without apology, we are always, always pouring in time and resources here at Lakeside to the next generation. It's not that the current generation or the generations that have gone before us don't matter, but we will constantly keep our focus on the generations to come. Because we have the experience and we have the wisdom that they need. And we can point them to Jesus. Let this be our rallying cry. It's not that the generation here now doesn't matter. But it is to say that we will take what we have and we will use it not just amongst ourselves, but we will put it out there for the generation that is to come. We have put our money where our mouth is in our renovations. We have put our money where our mouth is in bringing on a family life pastor. I don't know if if you're aware or not because a lot of you don't don't make it down there because you don't have kids. But know this, that in the last year, our children's ministry has grown by over 50% in one year. And you know what that means? Yeah, you can clap about that. That's really exciting. What that means... What that means is that more kids are hearing about the love and the hope of Jesus. That's what that means. And so we are, we are definitely excited about that. But we're not done. We're just getting started. And so as you heard earlier, partner with student ministries and see how you can be a resource to them as they start their programming in a week and a half. And we're so incredibly excited about that as well because the next generation always, always matters. Let us all have this perspective that King David had. That I will see what God has done in my life and I will use that to proclaim it to those who will come after me. Your righteousness, O God, reaches the high heavens. You who have done great things, O God, who is like you? You who have made me see many troubles and calamities will revive me again. From the depths of the earth you will bring me up again. You will increase my greatness and comfort me again. Here's the reality of life. You are going to go through hardships. You're going to walk through hardships. Life can be incredibly difficult. And every single one of us will face challenges. We will face troubles. The truth is that even with the advancements of modern medicine and additional care facilities, the process of aging can be incredibly difficult. In fact, surveys show us that the people who feel the most isolated and alone are the elderly. The people who feel the most isolated and alone are the elderly. It can be an incredibly difficult perspective to be going through life and all of a sudden have your body slow down and not be able to do the things that you want to do. To look around and to have friends start to pass away. And as that relationship circle grows smaller and smaller and smaller, can feel incredibly lonely. 
incredibly isolated. It can lead to depression and all kinds of other things that, that we've seen. And if you're there and if you're walking through that process, I want you to understand a couple things. First and foremost, the greatest hope that I can give you is this, that God's got you. God's got you. He has appointed your days. And none of this catches God by surprise. The diagnosis may have caught you and the doctors by surprise, but it did not catch God by surprise. The sudden passing that's impacted your circle of friends may have caught you all by surprise, but it didn't catch God by surprise. The greatest hope that I can offer you is this, that God's got you. Secondarily, I want to offer you this as well. We've got you. We've got you. We value everyone. We value every person. And our desire is not that Lakeside is something that you come and you do, but it is something that we all choose to be. This is community. The call is that none of us would walk through life alone. That no one would feel isolated. That no one would feel that they have to endure these hardships on their own. We stand together. We celebrate who God is, who Jesus is, but the love of God, we, we send forth to one another in tangible ways. So if you feel isolated and if you feel alone, I just want to encourage you, you don't have to go through life isolated and alone. And we can't change your feelings, but we can be an extension of the hope of Jesus, and that is our desire to be to you. And so so we want to pray with you, we want to encourage you, and we want to walk through life together as the community that God has called us to be. I will also praise you with the harp for your faithfulness. Oh my God, I will sing praises to you with the lyre. Oh Holy One of Israel, my lips will shout for joy when I sing praises to you, my soul also, which you have redeemed, and my tongue will talk of your righteous help all the day long. For they have been put to shame and disappointed who sought to do me hurt. When the times are good, when we see God work, when times are bad, when we feel isolated and alone, we have a choice. And David says, the choice for me is I'm going to rejoice. And might I suggest that the only way that this is possible in the midst of despair, in the midst of disease, in the midst of death, the only way this is possible is when we latch on to the words that Jesus said. That we have nothing to fear for those of us who follow him. Because we are God's children. And the very God who created us and knows how many hairs are on our head calls us his own. We've been given a map to life. And that's scripture. This is why we encourage you to have the Bible app on your phones and on your tablets so that you're engaging with the truths of scripture the timeless truth of Scripture in a changing and uncertain world. We encourage you to engage with it, to get to know the heart of God. So we've been given a map to life, to how to go through life when times are good, to how to walk through life when times are bad, how to handle the process of, of getting a diagnosis that we never saw coming. How to walk with confidence when it seems that we're knocking on death's door. That none of us would, would feel isolated and alone, but, but that we would follow God's plan and His promises according to Scripture. 
We have a map to life. But here's the great thing about community. Not only do we have a map to life in Scripture, but the beautiful thing about community is we also have guides along the way. Of people who've been down the road before that we're walking. And when we have a question, when the map doesn't seem to make sense or it seems that there's a detour that we don't, we don't really understand because we're in some foreign territory or we don't really know, we have the community to come around us. Like when you pull into the gas station when the phone doesn't have service anymore and you're lost. And you're just praying, please let it be an old guy because they know how to get everywhere. (laughs) Or an old lady. But I just wanted to be careful because sometimes when you say old lady, you know, you just stir up some things there. So I just went with guy. It's not to say that ladies don't know how to give directions. All right. We have a map. And the point of community to be guides, to be invested, to be engaged, to help each other. We've done a lot in this last year for the next generation, and we've celebrated that, and we will never lose our focus on that. But I'm really excited to announce something today for the first time. And this is geared for those of you who are 60 plus. Yeah, if you're 59 and a half, come on. If you're 58, we're going to be checking IDs at the door, all right? Just telling you right now. But on Tuesday, on Tuesday, November 19th at 1130 a.m., we're going to be doing a Friendsgiving. We're going to be doing a Friendsgiving. On Tuesday, November 19th at 11.30 a.m., where we're going to eat, we're going to talk, we're just going to spend time together. And I want to encourage you, as more details will be released this week on the website, lakeside-church.com, I want to encourage you, if you're over 60 and if you can make it, plan to be here. Plan to be at the Friendsgiving. It's going to be an incredible time. But we are not going to allow, we are not going to allow people to look at Lakeside and say, well, I'm part of the church, but I just don't feel connected. I feel isolated. I feel alone. If you feel isolated and you feel alone, what we're going to say is it's your fault, not ours. And this is going to be the first of, of many things that we roll out, but we're just encouraging you, if you can, Mark your calendar and plan to join us for the very first Friendsgiving. You're not going to want to miss it. On Tuesday, November 19th at 1130. And let's make sure that we as a community help each other. That the older people share their wisdom with the younger people. And the younger people share their wisdom with the older people and ask for their perspective and vice versa. And let's really live as a community. Pointing one another to Jesus, loving all we encounter, and making sure that no one feels isolated and alone. God, I pray that you'd help us. I pray that you'd help us be the church that you want us to be. I pray, God, that it would be all of our, just all of our rallying cry to say, we want to invest in the next generation. That we're going to take the lessons that we've learned and pour them into them. God, I pray that nobody would feel isolated and alone. That nobody would feel like they have to walk through life by themselves. God, I pray for people right here in the midst of a diagnosis or or for those who who are struggling with with death in their circle, death of a family member or a friend, and 
And God, maybe a number of them in a short time. And God, I just pray that even in the midst of their grief, they would choose because of who you are to rejoice. God, that you would work, not because you need us, but because you choose to use us for your glory. That all we encounter would experience the love of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.